practice the profound prajnaparamita should see in this way. Seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature, emptiness also is form, emptiness is no other than form, form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye datu up to no mind datu, no datu of dharmas, no mind consciousness datu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajnaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajnaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajnaparamita, <coughs> the mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth since there is no deception. The Prajnaparamita <coughs> mantra is said in this way, Te Ata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisoha. Thus Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family. Thus it is, O son of noble family. Thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly and the world, its gods, humans, asuras, and Gandharvas, <coughs> rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. <coughs> Kala jube ne jo damba ne ngushe du ju ngayi du du jen dru ba bo la ma yi bu shin zi ne sung kan ro tso la sha tse lu haka samara ta shandara samara ya Smarada Shandara Smaraya Mete Yata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisoha Baba Gonju Sumji Gai Dembe Doji Sher Noba Doji Meba Doji Shewa Doji Dragi Baji Meting Pe Shutanji Shedding Boy Zoa Gerin Dunja Jeju Shewa Dam Medun Be Jendan Dewa Dam Dumba drujim punzo zo joji dashi de jan dendan de le jo. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient living beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love, and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. <laughs> Zhang Ye Zhang 
Send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. Yedam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niradayami Kazaji Chedanzaji Janamla Janju Badu Dani Yazuji Dagi Chinji Bezananji Drola Benji Zanji Druba Chedanza Ji Chedanza Janju Badu Dani Yazuji Dagi Chinji Bezananji Drola Benji Zanji Druba Chedanza Ji Janamla Janju Badu Dani Yazuji Dagi Chinji Bezananji Drola Benji Zanji Druba Ju ナモンハイエクノロナネジンケジョモタダメイエクノタンドハクジタナチェザンタンジェケドダギジュドンドオッタリンガトカシュワタザニマゲチャジェンガトランドンチディアテ so now it, it seems like it seems as though every Sunday we're going over the lamp for the path to enlightenment by uh, Tisha. Um, so we're, we've been going over this particular text and we will get, continue to do so. <coughs> And this uh, text, the lamp for the path to enlightenment, is very important because, in abbreviation, it contains all of the teachings of Buddha, both the sutra and tantric teachings, in a condensed format. So, this is why this text is so important because everything the Buddha ever taught is within it. <laughs> It has a small amount of words, but the meaning is vast. So the Atisha was a, a scholar of the Nalanda Monastery, um, and it's uh, being compared to the greatness of a moon or the greatness of the sun. And then Atisha went to Tibet and was able to stabilize the teachings, um, and in particular using this text, the lamp for the path to enlightenment. So when Atisha came to Tibet, uh, he gave many different teachings and explanations, and he was able to purify or clean the teachings that had become uh, diluted. And today uh, we're celebrating uh, the birthday of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama is a great scholar with many abilities um, and uh, has an understanding of so many different things. And the Dalai Lama has compassion and love for all sentient beings, or the Dalai Lama 
uses all sentient beings uh, for the object of observation of his love and compassion. Uh, <coughs> so uh, this is very, a very important day to celebrate this holy being. So the Dalai Lama is now 70 years old. And I was asking, uh, wasn't it 71? And uh, according to the American calendar, uh, it seems as though he's 70, from the chase said. And it's very important that we request uh, the Dalai Lama to stay or to remain stable health-wise um, and to make these aspirations because uh, if he is able to stay with us, then he can be a benefit not only to the Tibetans but the entire world um, that he has uh, um, uh, been through or the entire world um, that has benefited from his teachings. So then the Dalai Lama uh, previously abided in Tibet and then was forced um, out of Tibet with uh, Dunta Jie, 8,000 um, other Tibetans. Uh, he was forced out of Tibet to India and put into exile and then was able to um, give the teachings to other places than Tibet throughout the world. Mm. So when the Tibetans arrived in um, uh, India, they were very poor and had very little um, things to use. But slowly, um, through the help of others um, and effort, they were able to make a Tibetan government in exile and be able to make schools and so forth to continue their education. So uh, they've been able to um, uh, um, work on these things even though they were so poor. <laughs> Mm. And then, uh, because the Dalai Lama has been able to travel to England and to the United States and to Russia and to various other places, um, he's been able to make connections um, with uh, these various um, uh, other traditions and been able to make friends with the Christians and make friends with um, Hindus and various other uh, religious traditions because they all respect him. Um, and it's because of the Dalai Lama's um, vast qualities that this has been able to happen. Mm. And it seems as though at the teachings themselves, His Holiness's teachings, um, those who assert they are religious and those who assert that they are not religious seem to come to hear His message. Mm. So if he is able to abide in this world longer, then there will be more benefit um, to the various other religious traditions um, and so forth. Mm. Mm. So uh, not only is this the celebration of the Dalai Lama's birthday, it's also the celebration of the first turning of the wheel of Dharma um, by Buddha in Varanasi, where he taught the Four Noble Truths, or gave an explanation of the Four Noble Truths. 
So because of the greatness of this day or the power of this day, um, if we can listen to the teachings or uh, give teachings um, or explanations of the teachings and so forth and engage in meritorious actions, then it will be very beneficial for us because of the power or greatness of this day. Mm. So uh, during this time, or during this holy era, or during this holy period of time, if we only engage in a very small amount of um, virtuous activity, then that small amount of virtuous activity is expanded or expands and becomes a much uh, greater um, amount of virtue than it would um, on another day. <laughs> So there have been three turnings of the wheel of Dharma uh, by Buddha. The first turning of the wheel of Dharma was in Varanasi where he taught the Four Noble Truths. Uh, the second turning of the wheel was in Grajagriya where he taught the um, Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge or the Heart Sutra. And then the third turning of the wheel was called the turning of the wheel of good differentiation. Um, and this turning of the wheel differentiated between various types of uh, teachings and gave explanations of them. Um, so there were three uh, historical turnings of the wheel, um, again to go over it, the first being the Four Noble Truths, second being the Heart Sutra, and the third um, the explanation of differentiation. Mm -hmm. So the first turning of the wheel dealt with those teachings for beings of small and medium capacity or the teachings of the small and medium scope. Mm -hmm. So when we speak of the small scope or teachings for beings of small capacity, this refers to those beings who recognize the good qualities um, of the life that they're in as a human at that point and recognize that they will die and in future lives will be reborn. And this type of being wishes for a rebirth into the higher realms, wishes to become a human again or wishes to become a demigod or a god and turns to the Buddha um, for the explanation of uh, the method to be able to achieve rebirth into the higher realms in the future lives. And then uh, the um, method that um, that being must uh, utilize in order to be reborn into the higher realms is a very stable refuge, um, uh, refuge in the three jewels, an understanding of the law of cause and effect or, or karma and its effect and confession or purification coupled with the four opponent powers. Um, so uh, this type of being uh, uses these methods in order to achieve rebirth into the gods and uh, uh, humans' realms. And this type of practitioner is called a being of small capacity. <laughs> Uh, so the next type of being, a being of medium capacity or middling capacity um, who practices the teachings of medium scope, um, recognizes the downfalls of all rebirth within cyclic existence, realizes that uh, not only do the lower realms have downfalls, but the higher realms have downfalls as well. Um, these beings are still guided by their afflictions and the, the cause and effect um, relationship with their afflictions and recognizes the suffering of the higher realms. 
and, and realizes wherever a being is in any of the six realms of cyclic existence, he or she has to have suffering, um, even in its subtlest form. So then a being of medium capacity um, has the motivation to transcend cyclic existence altogether and become liberated or to enter nirvana for him or herself alone um, and, and wishes to eradicate suffering and its causes altogether. So a being of medium capacity um, has the motivation to transcend cyclic existence altogether and to be liberated. Oggi dalle da nyomo bin debo dunge sizrang ki dunge le anna ngazu gabu yo maris jibun din de ge theme ba sugur beta sizrang ki dunge de dunge ta dunge ju nyomo ba de lesul gabu me te gabu me ba je te poya ki doba doba yo ken sol le tena sanje ge anne thabal ndo ya ge jibun din theme ki chu so uh, that type of being of medium capacity um, recognizes that karma and afflictions produce the six realms of cyclic existence or the six uh, contaminated uh, realms of rebirth and recognizes that there must be an abandonment of the causal factors for those types of negative rebirths and then uh, engages in various activities to be able to achieve liberation or to achieve uh, the state of nirvana for him or herself alone. Um, so the recognition of uh, the ne necessity to abandon um, various activities in order to produce the desired result of freedom or liberation. Mm. So this being of medium capacity or medium scope um, practices uh, in a um, very exclusive way the three higher trainings, um, the three higher trainings of ethics, concentration, and wisdom. And the concentration is the concentration which utilizes uh, the nature of reality as its object of observation um, or uh, emptiness as its object of observation. Um, and then so, so the following um, training is called the training in wisdom. So it's ethics, concentration, and wisdom. And the wisdom uh, relates to emptiness itself. Um, so uh, the being of medium capacity engages in ethical activities coupled with a concentration that uses emptiness as its object of observation and gains special insight relative to emptiness, which is wisdom. So um, the, the medium capacity practitioner or the Hinayana practitioner, these two names are synonymous, Hinayanist and uh, medium scope. Hinayana and medium scope are synonymous, translator's note, um, engages in these three trainings exclusively. Mm. So the, the small scope practitioner only looks for rebirth into a higher realm but is still bound to cyclic existence. And then the, uh, the did I say small scope? The small scope practitioner wishes to have rebirth into the higher realms um, but does not recognize the downfalls of uh, all of cyclic existence. The medium scope practitioner recognizes the downfalls of all of cyclic existence and wishes for liberation or, and nirvana. And this is the difference between uh, the two. Mm -hmm. Mm. So, but this does not mean when we speak of small and medium and so forth that a great scope practitioner disregards um, all of these smaller scopes. 
it's necessary, um, obviously, to understand the first turning of the wheel for um, a great uh, vehicle practitioner or uh, um, being of great capacity. Um, so this is why these are called teachings that are shared in common with beings of a small capacity and teachings that are shared in common with beings of a medium capacity because these uh, um, two scopes act as the causal factor for the great scope. So they are, um, the great scope is actually an effect which is dependent on its causes, and its causes are the, pr the prior scopes themselves. Um, so it's definitely not to say that a great vehicle practitioner throws out or disregards the Hinayana teachings because they are necessary um, as paths for that being as well. <laughs> So the lesser vehicle teachings are very similar to ground uh, or a fertile field. Um, if you have this stable fertile field, then you're able to grow flowers and able to grow um, vegetables and so forth. But if you don't have a stable fertile field, it's impossible. Likewise, it's necessary to have the stable fertile field of the lesser vehicle teachings in order pr to produce the result of the Mahayana vehicle or the Mahayana teachings or great vehicle teachings. So this medium scope or teachings for beings of medium capacity um, also has a focus on the Four Noble Truths and the Twelve Links of Dependent Origination. Um, so these two topics are also um, important to the medium uh, scope practitioner or being of medium capacity. So uh, when we look <coughs> at um, what the causal factors are for the great vehicle um, or the teachings of the um, great scope, we'll see that um, it's by practicing the paths that are shared in common with beings of a small capacity. Um, and practices that are shared in common with the beings of medium capacity um, and, and doing the seven limb prayer. Um, so these are all the preliminary practices of the great vehicle or the, um, of the Mahayana vehicle. <laughs> So at the root of the great vehicle teaching um, is the mind that aspires to uh, enlightenment. I'd forgotten to previously say that. And that is caused by the previous things that I spoke of, small, medium scope, and the seven limb prayer. So uh, what is bodhicitta? What is the mind that aspires to enlightenment? This is a mind that wishes to eradicate the suffering of all sentient beings and wishes all sentient beings to be brought to a place of happiness um, and, and wishes to ultimately bring all sentient beings to a state of enlightenment or Buddhahood. So this mind um, of bodhicitta is a very vast or strong mind because it looks to all sentient beings as its object of observation. So it isn't lim a limited type of mind. Um, and this is at the root of the Mahayana. So this type of mind is a very important and powerful mind and is uh, so beneficial 
Um, it is such a, a large type of mind or a vast mind that it's um, almost inconceivable. Um, just it's, imagine um, how much benefit is, uh, for example, to wish to help um, all the beings in Africa who are suffering. But imagine how much more powerful it would be to wish that all sentient beings uh, could be free from suffering or be brought to a state of happiness. We can see that um, the object of observation is much greater in the second example. The first example is very good and beneficial um, and is great to wish to help um, that nation. But imagine if you wish to help everyone. So this is why it's called the great vehicle. The great here refers to the greatness of the mind or the vastness of the mind. Um, so this is why uh, this particular vehicle is called um, called that. So last week we went over an explanation of the seven limb prayer, which we can see as a preliminary right is very important um, for the development of the mind that aspires to enlightenment. Um, uh, um, or um, the seven limb prayer is very important within the context of the great vehicle. Mm. So, uh, but when we say that um, there are various types of refuge, um, there might be a different kind of refuge that a being of the small capacity has, and a dip, uh, different kind of refuge that a being of medium capacity has, because the motivation of the refuge itself for those beings is a little bit different. The end result or end, uh, the destination uh, one wishes to um, arrive at is a little bit different. So we can say that there are refuges that are shared in common with the small scope and not in common with the small scope, and refuges that are shared in common with the medium scope, and refuges that are not shared in common with the medium scope, um, or refuges that are exclusive to each of those scopes, if that makes sense. That's <laughs> So um, when we look at the three types of suffering, we look at the suffering of uh, um, the suffering of suffering, um, the um, suffering of change, and the pervasive compounded suffering, and the suffering of uh, having to meet with the unpleasant and so forth. Um, then a, a type of fear arrives within our minds um, because we do not wish to have to endure these sufferings. And then we should look at the Buddha as a doctor. Um, and as the Dharma, as medicine, and as a nurse, uh, the um, Sangha, as a group of nurses or aids in our journey um, to relieve us from the sickness of the sufferings that we don't wish to endure. Mm. So if a being is ill, then he or she would probably go to a doctor, <coughs> then would diagnose him or her, 
and possibly say you have cancer or you have this particular disease. Then the doctor would prescribe medicine and if that person took the medicine that um, the doctor prescribed, then hopefully the illness could be eradicated. Likewise, um, if these uh, um, fears of the various types of suffering come into the mind and then we look to um, the Buddha um, and we see him or her as um, a doctor, who can diagnose our illness and then prescribe the Dharma which we can practice um, and if we practice that um, Dharma that was prescribed to us we can achieve liberation which is complete freedom from the types of sufferings we don't wish to endure um, so we have to look um, at these three jewels in the same way as we do a doctor medicine and a nurse um, because we are sick um, with the various types of suffering and they can be eradicated just as an illness can be. So, in the uh, one thing as far as refuge goes that is exclusive to um, the great uh, scope or the teachings um, of the great scope is the fact that this type of being goes for refuge um, for, to, in order to become a Buddha to eradicate all the sufferings of sentient beings. So the um, lesser vehicle practitioner doesn't have all sentient beings um, as, its ob as, as his or her object of observation for that refuge. Um, the motivation for the refuge is a little bit different. Um, the previous examples, um, um, we can say, are shared in common um, because the, uh, all of the scopes wish to be free from the types of suffering. But what is exclusive about the great vehicle is the added motivation um, to free all sentient beings. And this, the um, lesser vehicle is um, only for, um, uh, that being only goes for refuge for him or herself alone. That John Drew could the Kasong as a Jesus give a shoot over this. That the name that Taring as would take out to John to the Landrong is all in the Lua. Conju Sanju Nibi Tatuba, Maduba is sent out here, Conju Sola Radiji, Pemulanga Satune. ทำมาเจอเรื่องสุชาติทำมาเจอเรื่องสุชาติเสียจังดูโอเทเรเทเนเรดัวเรื่องอะไรโอเทเนดูเดชาวะข้าศรีเอ็งลาดูบักชูโ
till you gain ultimate enlightenment. And with strong faith in the three jewels, kneeling with one knee on the ground and your hand, hands pressed together, first of all, take refuge three times. Um, so in this particular uh, text, here it's talking about with the thought never to turn back, so to never give up uh, this wish to um, achieve enlightenment or to never give up the refuge itself and with strong faith in the three jewels. Here the strength of faith is referred to because there are different levels of faith that someone can have. Someone can have a small amount of faith, someone can have a medium amount of faith, someone can have a great amount of faith. So here the strong refers to having a great amount of faith or a, a very stable amount of faith. So kneeling with one knee on the ground so if one can, putting one knee on the ground as a sign of homage and bowing and pr your hands pressed together. Here this refers to making the mudra of uh, prayer um, by placing the hands together in prayer. Um, uh, first of all, take refuge three times. Um, and then uh, Rinpoche said that um, uh, taking refuge three times and then coupled with uh, this mind generation or the mind that aspires to enlightenment. Um, to, to also work to generate that with the refuge. So it's very important though if we're going to speak of refuge um, to uh, learn about what that truly means uh, because it's easy to say just the words themselves, but it's important to know what is the nature of, what is the meaning of a Buddha, who is that, what is the meaning of the Dharma, uh, what is the nature of the Dharma, what is the meaning of the Sangha, who is the Sangha, what is the nature of the Sangha. So it's very important to understand the details of that in order for us to have a stable refuge, because if we don't have a stable refuge and we don't um, uh, if we don't ha under ex let me reverse that. If we don't have an understanding of what we're taking refuge in, it's impossible for that refuge to be stable. So first of all, when we speak of the Buddha jewel, um, the Buddha jewel refers to the Buddhas. Um, Shakyamuni Buddha, the 35 Buddhas within the, the text called the 35 Buddhas of Confection, Confession, uh, Tara, who is a Buddha, any of the other deities um, that are actual Buddhas um, that uh, re, um, fall into the category of the Buddha jewel. So, Buddha Shakyamuni was at one time exactly like ourselves. He had the afflictions uh, and, uh, that we have, has the su had the sufferings that we have, um, but was able to practice a path um, which contained renunciation, and love and compassion um, and uh, the mind that aspired to enlightenment and the wisdom realizing emptiness um, and then through practicing um, those various paths was able to get rid of the afflictive obstructions within his mental continuum as well as the obstructions to omniscience um, and then became enlightened and like Bodhisattva Shakyamuni we can do the same thing if we practice the same path so when we speak of the Dharma jewel, uh, this refers to 
the actual um, realization of emptiness um, at the path of seeing or at the path of meditation um, or the um, refers to the true paths or true cessations within the context of the Four Noble Truths. Um, so this Dharma jewel refers to the realization of emptiness um, at those various levels of realization starting at the path of seeing. <clears throat> so those beings um, who are superior beings um, or, uh, or Arya beings who have had uh, the, the true, true paths and true cessations um, uh, starting at the path of seeing, those types of beings who within the, their continuum have had these realizations are called the Sangha Jewel. Um, so the Sangha Jewel or Spiritual Community Jewel are beings who have reached the path of, uh, the, um, path of seeing or above. And then there are the beings um, on the hearer's vehicle at the path, who've reached the path of seeing, solitary realizer's vehicle who've reached that path, and the Bodhisattva vehicle who've reached that path, or the Mahayana vehicle who've reached that path. So all of those beings who um, have reached the path of seeing are referred to as the Sangha or spiritual community. Shanchu so when we look at the mind that aspires to enlightenment or bodhicitta, <clears throat> there are two types. There is the aspiring bodhicitta and the um, actual um, bodhicitta or the engaged bodhicitta. It's called two things. Um, and uh, it's necessary to have the aspiring bodhicitta in order for the engaged bodhicitta to be produced. But bodhicitta itself or the mind that aspires to enlightenment itself is an effect and all effects are dependent upon their causes. Um, and there are two vehicles or two lineages um, of instruction for uh, causal factors for the mind that aspires to enlightenment. Um, one of them was passed down from Lord, Matraya, Lord Matraya to a Sangha in the extensive deeds lineage. And that particular practice is called the seven point cause and effect for achieving the mind that aspires to enlightenment or for achieving bodhicitta. Um, the second lineage of instruction um, is called the Profound View Lineage, and that was passed down from uh, Manjushri to uh, Nagarjuna, um, down to Shantideva, and so forth. Um, and uh, that particular lineage of instruction is called Equalizing and Exchanging Self with Others. So the two lineages, uh, Extensive Deeds Lineage, Seven Point Cause and Effect, um, and the profound view lineage, the um, equalizing and exchanging self and others explanation. So today, we're going to go over um, the instruction uh, of the seven point cause and effect for achieving enlightenment. I mean, uh, the, for achieving the mind that aspires to enlightenment. So this practice is as follows. The first step is called recognizing all sentient beings have been our mother. The second is remembering their kindness. The third, wishing to repay their kindness. The fourth, love through the force of attraction. The fifth, great compassion. Sixth is uh, extraordinary attitude or the special attitude. Um, and the seventh is the actual result, which is mind generation or the mind that aspires to enlightenment. So here in this particular practice, there are six causal factors which produce the result of the mind that aspires to enlightenment. Um, so uh, that is the um, 
uh, actual process step by step in the practice of the seven point cause and effect for achieving the mind that aspires to enlightenment. <laughs> Tanyu de Tanyu is again the Karasa Gosana, and then Asu Sijan, Golo Masu, Kashi Sijan, Susu Magasa, and Asu Dazalo Waris, Gabu Yosadele, Susu Tobo to Zulu Nazi Nieres, Da Nies, and the Niel Gabaji Gore, Dal Magaji Waris, Dal Magajina, Kontrium Gore, Niel Gabajin, Chaba Yungore, Pamis Sijan Taras Danyu Yusha Waris, Sijan Rizun Dungers, Da Nye, Pamason Dungers. So uh, uh, these six um, causal factors for achieving the mind that aspires to enlightenment have a pre-step, and that pre-step is called equanimity. Um, and here, uh, equanimity refers to an equal mind relative to all beings. Um, um, now we see that uh, we have enemies, um, and then uh, anger comes uh, relative to the enemies that we have, and we hate them. Uh, we have friends uh, who we like very much and our mind becomes very pleasant when we see them. Um, and then uh, attachment takes place to our friends. Uh, and then there are those strangers that we don't know that we just disregard altogether. So equanimity is trying to get an equal mind relative to these three types of beings. <laughs> Uh so this equanimity is very similar to a fertile ground which can produce the mind that aspires to enlightenment. It's because if this fertile ground is not present, or this stable ground is not present, then uh, recognizing all sentient beings as having been our mother um, isn't possible, and uh, remembering their kindness is impossible, and so forth. So we must have this stable ground, um, or this ground that is equal relative to the three types of beings in order to move forward uh, in our, the stages of the path. Um, so when we look at our enemies, it's important to not have anger towards them. Uh, when we look at our friends, it's important not to have attachment towards them. And when we uh, look at neutrals or strangers, it's important not to just disregard them altogether or to throw them out, literally. Um, we have to have an equal mind towards all those types of beings in order to have a stable ground that can produce the latter realizations. <laughs> Tabuna, Niel Chabaji Waters, Niel Chabaji do, near the Tanda Nego near Rematu, Hama near the Gay, Masu Trubu, and Masu Damoji Savaris, Hama Ku Pama Mobojevare, Dajevare, Kanga Mobojevares, Tanda Masu Magas, Dadea, Hama Masu Trubujine, Gabo Mobojes Savaris, Jewangama, Jewangama, Sendelina, the Nemurota. And the Pamisi to Zukangalo, and Sangama Nazu, Hama Mobujes of his, Nazuki, Trobo Mobujes of his, Dram Mobujes of his, the Zukangal Chebayo Marasantana, and Saint Yamu Yungusers. So it's impossible to arrive at this mind of equanimity um, if it's impossible um, if we don't have reasons for this. We have to have reasons why uh, we should have this mind of equanimity. And the reasons are as follows. Our friends that we are so attached to previously in future lives, I, I mean previously in future lives, uh, previously in past lives, or even in this lives, uh, have been our enemy, have been our parents, have been so many things to us that we can't say that they're truly our friends. Um, and our enemies in previous lives, and even maybe in this life, um, have been our greatest friends, um, and so forth. And these people we look at as strangers, 
in our previous lives or even in, uh, in this life um, at some point in time might have been our greatest friends or our greatest enemies. Um, so these three types of beings have the potential to be anything to us and this is why we should look at them equally. <laughs> so these, these names, friends, enemies, and strangers don't have any nature of this or that um, from their own side to us. ロジュワタンシアンドワトゥイジロタ <laughs> ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ。ロジュ
तने सेजे ताजे रां के माँ ये बाला माँ ये बसान ताऊ को यार बे माँ मे बाला अंत से तगाज माँ सान ताऊ जब तने जब स्टेबल ही ना अं सेजे ताजे रां आमर है दिवा रहे हैं आमा ये बाला आमा ये बात गोंग हो रहे हैं तो साल ताऊ हो रहे हैं तो साल ताऊ भाई ना पहने चुप रहे हैं so here we need to begin to um, meditate on and analyze all sentient beings have been our mother. Are all sentient beings our, our mothers? Are they all our mothers? So we need to start to um, think about this uh, and come to um, the conclusion uh, that they have been because it's be very beneficial uh, for our minds to recognize this fact that all sentient beings are our mothers. ตาสิงห์ท่านจะไม่เห็นบัดเดี๋ยวเช้ามุมสันตานามาตัวสิงห์ท่านจะไม่เห็นบัลลูลชาคัลเลขาบุรุษสิงห์ท่านจะไม่
the consciousness uh, goes into the mother's womb or once the conception has taken place, once the sperm and egg come together. Um, and then the various other uh, um, faculties arrive after the consciousness. So the wind and the fire and the, the, the various elements, the um, wind and the fire and the water and the earth are formed. And then the various hands and so forth of the baby are formed. Um, so this is where it is said the consciousness comes from. It comes from the previous consciousness. Mm. So where did this consciousness of the intermediate state come from? This consciousness of the intermediate state came from the previous birth um, that that uh, being's continuum had. So there has been beginningless rebirth. So this cycle has um, gone on and on. Um, there has been a being uh, who is alive, passes away, enters the intermediate state, and then pass, uh, passes from the intermediate state to another birth. So consciousness has, uh, um, there's been a continual stream, continuous stream, beginninglessly, of consciousness. What the Shiva Tuma members? Shiva Ku Shiva Hamaj Shiva Regur Madu, Shiva Mayim Shiva Rayo Maris. Dream I imagine Dejak Mudwas, Dejak and Dejakud was. Then Naji, Shiva Yungan, the Shiva Jikurum, Shiva Rayo Madu, Shiva Mayim Sachu to Shiva Rayo Maris. So uh, we say that consciousness is beginningless because it's impossible to have other than consciousness or something other than consciousness that creates consciousness. Consciousness must create consciousness. Causes are concordant with their effects. Something other than rice doesn't produce a rice uh, sprout. You can't take a different, uh, different kind of seed and plant it and expect to get rice. Um, likewise, consciousness must produce consciousness. Okay. Okay. So, uh, since this consciousness has been beginningless and we've had beginningless rebirths, um, we can say that yes, um, at some point in time, all sentient beings have been our mother because there's been a beginningless range of rebirths. Um, and we cannot assert or find one who hasn't. Um, we can't find a being who hasn't been our mother. So then do we say that all sentient beings are our mother? Well, if we had not forgotten um, our previous lives and we had not forgotten that they had been our mothers, then of course we would call them mother. We would say that yes, they are our mother um, because of their previous um, uh, kindness towards us. It's just the fact that we've forgotten it. So we need to think about this a lot. And if we do think about this a lot, then we can arrive at, yes, all sentient beings are our mother. But if we don't think about this a lot, then it'll be quite impossible for us to have this realization. Then the da kare, chichin sewa da, the da kare, yimbi chere kare, ngi jesa. Sheba jema tabe, sheba chue, pugu jema tabe, sheba chue, je sheba de roa. Pugu. Pugu sen de chayo. Toma tongu chayo jenga te sheba, sheba de chue je, reba ngama ngha du sun te, reba yimbi e shes re. Sheba yin zang sheba ngama ngha du sun gu res. Sheba ngama ji sheba re yonra ma du, sheba ma yimbi sheba re yonra ma du. So the reason, is given as, as follows. The subject, a child, um, has consciousness. 
um, where uh, uh, does this consciousness come from? And then the answer is, it comes from consciousness because knowing must be caused by knowing. A knower produces a knower, so consciousness produces a, a consciousness. So the consciousness is a previous consciousness. Um, so this is one reason that is given. And the second reason that is given is the actual breath or the breathing or the wind. Um, where does this wind come from? It must come from a previous wind um, itself because uh, that's uh, what it must be concordant with its cause. Mm. Mm. So it also states that there must be a previous life because this breathing in and out, this natural breathing in and out, um, must have come from a previous natural breathing in and out. So this breathing in and out or this wind uh, is concordant with its cause. Uh, so if we close, cover our mouths, or our face, and we don't breathe, if we could, we would die. Um, so we can say that uh, that breath must come from a previous um, nature of breath. So it's also said that the, where do the six sense powers come sense from? Powers, yeah. uh, the six sense powers, um, the eye sense power, the nose sense power, the tongue sense power, the ear sense power, the tactile sense power, and the, the um, mental sense power. Yichi wombo yurube. Yichi Okay, mental sense power. Um, so these six sense powers come from previous sense powers, um, or the nature of sense powers. They're, they, they're, they're a result, and they must be concordant. Uh, so the um, basis uh, uh, for these sense powers um, must come from a previous uh, sense power basis. Mm. So there are three explanations here that are given to assert uh, previous lives, but the best one um, is the consciousness example. Um, that's really the most uh, stable example. So we can find in the um, Dharma Kirtis, Pramana Vartika Karika, um, the Compendium to Valid Cognition, uh, where it is asserted that there are three reasons to assert uh, um, a previous life. Uh, the consciousness, the breathing, or the wind, and the sense powers. And these three can prove that there are previous lives. So at this point, we don't have clairvoyance. Um, so we really um, can't see previous lives and so forth. Um, so it's important that we rely upon reason in order to come to the conclusion, in order to come to an incontrovertible conclusion that there are past and future lives. Um, without reliance um, on these reasons um, and without having clairvoyance, it'd be very difficult for us to have a stable um, realization that there are past and future lives. So we can even see on the news there are reliance upon correct signs. Uh, when we look at the weather, for instance, they say, oh, tomorrow it's going to rain, it's going to be sunny, and so forth. Um, there are these machines that they have, and the machines come up with various data, and then there is a sign that tomorrow there will be rain. 
Um, so we can see here there's a reliance upon reasons um, from a scientific perspective um, as well. Um, so there's reliance upon a sign. Um, so this um, then, uh, when one relies upon a sign and the sign is correct, uh, and then eventually that understanding uh, becomes incontrovertible um, and valid, then that being revi uh, arrives at um, an inferential cognition um, of past and future lives, or arrived at through inference. Uh, so also we can see in our lives that we rely upon reasons all the time. Uh, for instance, when we see someone um, and they have a very scorning type, uh, kind of a uh, very angry look on their face and their face is very red, we can assume that they're angry. Um, we can make that assumption through the sign of their face and you know, their various physical actions. So we see that we use reason throughout our lives and to arrive at fact. So we see doctors use this uh, inferential cognition to diagnose. Um, they listen to various things and uh, uh, they perform various tests and then they're able to say you have cancer, you have this disease, you have that disease. Um, so we can see they utilize reason in the same way that we would in this instance. So if we rely upon reason um, and engage in a thorough analysis about past lives, about future lives, about the two truths, about the four noble truths, about karma and its effects, uh, we will slowly um, have a more stable understanding that won't change um, in the future. So, if we think along these lines again and again, um, then we will be able to arrive at this first step, which is recognizing all sentient beings as our mothers or as having been our mothers. Um, it's translated two ways, um, could, and it can be. Mm -hmm. So when we say um, all sentient beings are our mother or have been our mother, um, this isn't something that's exclusive um, because they've been our fathers also. Um, they've been our siblings, they've been our friends, they've been our enemies, they've been uh, strangers to us, they've been all of these different things to us as well. Um, so they're not limited to just being our mothers. Mm. So uh, the next uh, remembering their kindness refers to the kind acts that they've done for us, such as giving us milk and food and taking care of us and so forth. Mm. The first stage, um, our mother has, was very kind to us, uh, carrying us in her womb, um, having to deal with the various difficulties of carrying a child in a womb, having to uh, think about everything that she did, um, whether it would hurt the baby or not, having to, um, uh, you know, eat certain foods and drink certain things and stay uh, healthy and to worry about which way she la laid down um, to make sure that the baby wouldn't be hurt. So we can see in the initial stages um, how kind she was to us because if this kindness hadn't been present, um, then there's no way we would have survived. 
Then Bogo Majes <laughs> about Yena, the Nepoco, but over it, and she would you almost soon and Lomo was so good, was it? I'm a garden she was his. Boo down drop or boo bug. Could Chunjon or the Chunjon to Kuji Shigma or Mati in the Galicia. Galicia would was. And then when the child is born, child is very small and can't do anything for him or herself. Uh, he has to take the mother from the milk. He, he or she has to take the mother from the milk and uh, has to be cared after. Um, uh, because could, uh, he or she could pass very easily and is very delicate. So the mother is very kind in the next phase because the baby must be looked after day and night. Or uh, uh, he didn't say day and night, uh, all the time. <laughs> so it's because of this that our mothers have been very kind. Mashabatin <laughs> So the next step is an actual wish to repay their kindness because we've recognized the kind things that our mothers have done and so forth um, and then we wish to repay their kindness in some way and uh, sure uh, giving some food or giving some drinks and so forth would be nice um, but that really doesn't repay the kindness. That doesn't give them uh, what they truly wish for, desire. Because um, we can see, like ourselves, sentient beings wish to have happiness and be oh, free from suffering. Hot, hot, and uh, this doesn't uh, um, allow them to arrive at that result. Um, so then, uh, having this motivation to wish to repay their kindness, we move to the next steps, which we spoke of before, which are love through the force of attraction um, and great compassion. Because first we wish to repay their kindness, and then we find out how that could be repaid um, uh, by engaging in analysis um, and recognizing that they wish to have happiness and not have suffering. Mm. So the first one we arrive at is love through the force of attraction. Um, and this refers to um, the wish uh, that sentient beings have happiness, the recognition that like ourselves, all sentient beings wish to have happiness. Um, and then uh, the desire, um, in a, not in a negative way, the desire to um, bring them to a state of happiness um, is uh, the meditation on love. It's very beneficial to use all sentient beings as the object of observation for our meditation upon love. <coughs> so any pleasant um, thing that we experience now is probably a result of a previous familiarization with love. Mm -hmm. At the time of Buddha's passing um, into Nirvana, um, he was sitting under the um, Bodhi tree um, and uh, various and, um, evil spirits and maras and so forth were trying to harm him um, as he sat under the Bodhi tree and they yielded various weapons they had swords and various arrows and stuff they were, and things that they were trying to harm the Buddha with but the Buddha was um, uh, in uh, meditation um, at that point and he was meditating upon love um, so none of the arrows or swords were able to hurt him because of this, uh, the power of his meditation. And every time that they would get anywhere near him with those weapons, the weapons would automatically turn into flowers. Um, so here in this example, in the Buddha's lifetime, we can see how powerful uh, meditation upon love actually is. So 
ਅਨ ਦੁਗਨ ਬਾਚੇ ਮੈਂ ਬਤਾ ਅਨ ਮੇਜੇ ਦਾ ਸੋਸੋਲ ਗਾਬੀ ਹੋਇਆ ਉਹ ਤੋਂ ਸੇ ਸ਼ਮਾ ਗੂਮ ਦੇ ਹੋਈ ਸਰ so um also you know the result of the meditation upon love is that uh the obstacles and so forth um are removed and others would um uh like us so we can see that there are other benefits to this meditation on love tene sinje tha suju dunge mande ba na je sinje tha je dunge de o mare sinje tha je dunge de tan je maru nya be saun lo yan yan ta ba de hi ji chamba sir hi chamba san ta ba So the next step great compassion uh is as follows recognizing that like ourselves all sentient beings do not wish to have suffering um and then the desire to uh bring them to a place that is free from suffering is the main characteristic of uh great compassion or meditation on great compassion so great compassion is the wish that sentient beings be free from suffering altogether ਉਹ ਜੇ ਤਾਂ ਟੋਬਾ ਦੇ ਹਸਾਂ ਸੇ ਗਰਸ ਹਸਾਂ ਹਾਂ ਅਨੇ ਹਸਾਂ ਸੇ ਆ ਦੇ ਸਿੰਜੇ ਤਾਂ ਜੀ ਦਵਾਲ ਦਵਾਲ ਗੋਇਆ ਦੇ ਨਰੋਂ ਰੰਗ ਜੀ ਗਈ ਸਿੰਜੇ ਤਾਂ ਜੀ ਦੋਹਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਬਦ ਨਰੋਂ ਰੰਗ ਜੋ ਗਈ ਹਾਂ ਸੈਂ ਸੂ ਚਬੋ ਅਨੇ ਸੈਂ ਸੂ ਚਬੋ ਗਰਸ ਹਾ ਵੀ ਸੰਭਾ ਹਾ ਵੀ ਸੰਭਾ ਲਸੋ ਐਂਡ ਦ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਦ ਐਕਸਟਰੋਰਡਨਰੀ ਐਟੀਟਿਊਡ ਅਮ ਇਜ਼ ਐਨ ਐਟੀਟਿਊਡ ਥੈਟ ਸਟੇਟਸ ਆਈ ਵਿਲ ਟੇਕ ਇਟ ਅਪਨ ਮਾਈਸੈਲਫ ਟੂ ਮੇਕ ਸ਼ੂਰ ਥੈਟ ਆਲ ਸੈਂਟੀਅਨ ਬੀਇੰਗਸ ਆਰ ਇਨ ਅ ਸਟੇਟ ਆਫ ਹੈਪੀਨੈਸ I will take it upon myself as my role to make sure that sentient beings are all free from suffering. Um so this extraordinary attitude um is called that because it's not ordinary for one to take it upon themselves to uh um free all sentient beings from suffering and to bring all sentient beings to a state of happiness. Ta sinjen ta je ge ne dunge me ba da dawal ngo ya da ro ra ge je ni sal sen shu chebu yo re tene tenge ne ge duye tu ge duye sal da ba ina ta na ga tu tu ayo ma re ke na tu ro ba ha ko sa ta sul ne ba yo re san da sa je yo re na sinjen ta je ge tu sa je ko mo tu sa je ko mo tu san na sa je ta je chen ba re ne chen ba da sa wa da ne ba ta chen ba re tene sinjen ta je dawal ngo ya da dunge me ba tu re ta ba ne sa je wo du san na sinjen ta je ge tu sa je tu ba sha wo na ba san la tu sa je sa je ko ba sa re So then uh the recognition takes place that I don't have the ability um to be able to bring all sentient beings to a state of happiness. I don't have the ability to free all sentient beings from their suffering. Um and then uh, uh the practitioner looks to a being who does. Um and that being is Buddha. Buddha is omniscient um and is able to know what all sentient beings truly need. Um Buddha uh, has love and compassion for them so the um wish to do so is there um and as an ordinary being we don't have the capacity to truly help others in the um uh, final way um or to truly be of benefit to others um so then the seventh uh result is produced the the result takes place um the actual mind generation or the mind that aspires to enlightenment because the being recognizes that he or she can't free all sentient beings and then wishes to become a buddha for the sake of all sentient beings so this is how the seven point cause and effect uh works and this is how the six causes produce the seventh step ta sha ju ju the sen je ba da sha ju sen ba so ge sen je bi chu ma da so yo so ge res ja bu ta bi sen je ba nya ba ta bi sen je ba de ne shu ju ta bi sen je ba so so ge res ta na de ne ta na ga su she de ja bu ta bi sen je de res ta ba na pa na amara ga lo ba ma su le an ji phe tu ba ji ji ya ge de ba she che bu yo ba yi na ta bo amara ga pha je je tu ba yi na and the amara ga mangal phe phe ba du tu ro ba tin ra bo yi sa ris and the sinje tha je de walo go ya do do ge me ba me bi sa sa lo du ye so sa and the ta bo ja bu ta bo sa je ko tu so na ane phe tu yung ko re sa ne ane se je tha je ko tu sa je ko tu ba ja wo nya be sa lo ya ne ya du ye ken tele ane ja bu ta bi se je ba sa ju sa ba ri ji wo den de sa ju sa ri so there are three lineages of bodhisattvas so there's three kinds of um, mind generation or mind that aspires to enlightenment there's a uh, bodhicitta um or bodhisattva that is like an oarsman a uh, bodhisattva that is like a king and bodhisattva that is like a a, a herdsman um so first uh um 
uh, we'll talk about uh, the bodhicitta that is like a king. Um, and if one, for instance, wishes to truly be of benefit to the United States, um, the person who is in the most, uh, the best position to do so, for instance, is the President of the United States. Um, so this uh, person uh, becomes the President in order to truly benefit the nation. Likewise, uh, in order to truly benefit all sentient beings, it's necessary to be a Buddha. Um, so this type of bodhicitta is the one that wishes to uh, quickly become a Buddha um, in order to then be of true benefit for other sentient beings. Um, so this is why it's called bodhicitta that is like a king, or bodhisattva like a king. <laughs> So the bodhicitta that is like an oarsman um, is the type of uh, bodhicitta that wishes that um, uh, oneself and all sentient beings simultaneously go to enlightenment um, at the same time. So this is why it's called like an oarsman, because it's similar to everybody being in one boat, um, in one boat, and going together simultaneously to Buddhahood. Um, so this type of bodhicitta is bodhicitta like an oarsman, and this is the um, second in the lineages of bodhisattvas. Mm. And then the last is the bodhicitta um, that's like a herdsman. Um, and this refers to the bodhicitta that um, states that I will be the last being um, who uh, to achieve Buddhahood. I will make sure that I um, herd up in a sense, all sentient beings and bring them to a place of enlightenment and then I will wait till the um, last to become enlightened myself. So uh, this bodhicitta is called bodhicitta like a herdsman and this is the third in the lineage of bodhisattvas. So, if we um, engage in an analysis of uh, this seven point cause and effect again and again, um, it will become stable. We have to think again and again if all sentient beings are our mother, have been our mother remembering their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness, uh, love through the force of attraction, um, great compassion, the extraordinary attitude, and the result of bodhicitta, or the mind that aspires to enlightenment. Uh, this will become more and more stable and more and more incontrovertible as we um, become more familiar with it. So for those who are meditators, um, this is a very good uh, meditation to do, to engage in meditation and think about this. All sentient beings have been our mother and think about their kindness, remembering it and wishing to repay it. This is a very good uh, practice for those who are meditators. Mm. So if we can arrive at this mind that aspires to enlightenment, um, if we have this bodhicitta, then Tantra works. Then we can actually engage in Tantra. Um, and it'll make it so that uh, all the abilities um, of Tantra are there. Um, if we do not have um, bodhicitta, then Tantra um, is quite impossible. It really doesn't work. So if we have um, this mind that aspires to enlightenment, um, or bodhicitta, then we can do these higher practices. This is what fuels them, or makes these other practices work. Uh, such as the Dzogchen practice, or the Mahamudra practice, or the union of bliss and emptiness practice, um, uh, the, all the higher practices 
um, have pre uh, prerequisite, have preliminaries, and that is the uh, mind that aspires to enlightenment. Mm. And this mind generation takes, can take place in any of the realms. Uh, we can say that surely there are bodhisattvas in all six realms of cyclic existence. There are bodhisattvas who are in hell. There are bodhisattvas who are hungry ghosts realm. There are bodhisattvas who are animals. There are bodhisattvas who are humans. Bodhisattvas that are demigods and bodhisattvas that are gods. Hunters. So there's a story um, of wild animals in um, Buddha's previous life um, uh, when he was in a herd of 500 animals and Buddha was the king of the herd and there was a queen um, also of the herd and some hunters arrived uh, and came to kill uh, the animals. And Buddha stepped forward in Buddha's previous life, the, the wild animal king stepped forward and stated, please take my life, kill me, um, and I don't wish uh, for you to hurt the other herd. Um, and at that point, he did this because he had already achieved the mind that aspired to enlightenment, or had, he had already had bodhicitta. <laughs> Mm. So then, um, uh, after that, the queen also came by the uh, king's side and said, please, if you're going to take him, take me as well. Um, and this sort of behavior is obviously extraordinary. The, we wouldn't see a wild animal um, if they didn't have a special mind who would uh, volunteer themselves for death. Mm -hmm. So uh, then what happened to these beings in the future? Um, the um, king of the wild animals was Buddha Shakyamuni. And uh, the wife um, or the queen of the animals became uh, Buddha Shakyamuni's atten attendant, Gunkoho, Gunkaho. And um, the other 500, uh, 500 animals um, uh, became the uh, 500 monks, um, 500 ordained people of the time of Buddha. Um, so we can see how connections take place and how uh, the law of cause and effect um, uh, works.
ਬਸੋ and the Jenda Gangalo Radanga Jangi Tuberis, Tubungaja the Gulungaja Tres, Na Rada Jabudangaris, Kunga was Rada Motres, or the Sumers. So then the monks uh, went out to uh, beg for alms because at the time they didn't have food. They um, went out and begged for food with begging bowls and so forth, the time of Buddha. And um, Devadatta had unleashed, Devadatta was an enemy of. Um, Buddha and had unleashed a crazy elephant um, throughout town uh, to try to go after Shakyamuni's men um, or Buddha's men, um, which were monks. It wasn't an army, so I want to make that clear. Um, and this crazy elephant arrived, um, and all of the 500 monks ran away. Some of them hid hidden trees and climbed trees. Others hid behind things. But Gung Kao uh, hid behind Buddha. Um, and then uh, Buddha actually put his hand out and not sure if produced fire or a lion or something, but was able to subdue the crazy elephant. Uh, the um, elephant just suddenly snapped out of it and was no longer crazy. Um, and then they asked, uh, some people had asked, why did this happen? What just went on? And Buddha began to tell a story. Buddha stated that the 500 monks who are hiding were 500 wild animals um, uh, during one of my previous lives that I saved um, from being killed um, when I was a, a wild animal king. Gung Kaho, who is standing behind me, was my wife um, and stood behind me um, throughout that entire thing. Um, stood behind me in the sense of also uh, wishing to have her life taken. Um, so this is why uh, she stood behind me in this particular um, case. So Buddha um, gave this particular teaching in, in order to explain the law of karma and its effects and how connections are made. So this mind that aspires to enlightenment or bodhicitta is very powerful. It's stated that if an animal has uh, the mind that aspires to enlightenment or is a bodhisattva, then even the gods bow down to him or her. So I think that we're going to end the session for the day. Um, we've uh, given an explanation of the mind that aspires to enlightenment and so forth, and uh, we will give further explanation, of course, in the future. Um, uh, we have a lot of food in there to eat and so forth. Uh, we're having the party. So if we could do go through the concluding prayers, um, and we will begin uh, to eat. Maybe. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I have collected for the benefit of the teachings and of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozandrapa to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh.
Dagi jinye zabenge wadi Dendon roa kula gambendon Jeba jetsun lozon drabai Dendon nimbo rindu zenye Idam Guru Radha Mandala Gamni Radha Yami. I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised as supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. <laughs> Bondu Sambo de Ande Jende, De da Gunji Jesu da Loche, De wa de da Tanche Ratumo, Du son Jepe, De wa Tanche Ji, Mawa Gala Chutunga Pade, Da Jen de wa Sawa de Gunta, Sambo Juchi, Tumo. In the heavenly realm of Tibet, surrounded by chain of snow In the heavenly realm of Tibet, surrounded by a chain of snow mountains, the source of all happiness and health for beings is Tenzin Yatso, Chen Rezigan person. May his life be secure for hundreds of kalpas. <laughs> Yeah. 
So uh, we're going to now do the Paul and Lamo um, mantra. mantra with the uh, homage. No one has the books. We need to hand the books out, um, if you would. Thank you. We need the time check here. Do you want to um, grab all the singing bowls? And hand them to the cool, 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 cool. You understand how to do it, Rumi Jay said, so you should do one. Should do it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are there any more up there? I don't think so. What does it do? You, you. you. <laughs> Yeah. This mantra is on uh, the seventh page. Thanks, John. <laughs> uh, sixth page. Gotcha. Dude. Because the inch angle, the sabatul. Jenda da ko. Ah. Gotcha, don't worry. Chat. Na ju sa dunem ne de mar. Wo cha dunem de. Okay. So, uh, you open it up. It says Paul Den Lamo mantra and then homage underneath it. Uh, we're going to do it as usual. We do seven times the Paul and Lamo mantra, um, and then the homage we just do in the Tibetan transliteration at the bottom with the bells, um, and Maybe that will be done in. three times. Seven. seven times as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yo Ramo Jo Ramo Jo Jo Ramo Dunjo Kalarajan Mo Ramo Vaja Daja Dunjo Rulu Rulu Honjo Yo Ramo Jo Ramo Jo Jo Ramo Dunjo Kalarajan Mo Ramo Vaja Daja Dunjo Rulu Rulu Honjo Yo Ramo Jo Ramo Jo Jo Ramo Dunjo Kalarajan Mo Ramo <laughs> Yo Ramo Jo Ramo Jo Jo Ramo Dun Jo Gala Rajan Mo Ramo Vaja Daja Dun Jo Rulu Rulu On Yo Oh. 
So we're going to do uh, the long life prayer for the Dalai Lama in Tibetan three more times. Um, then we'll do a uh, long life prayer for Kenso Geshe Wandak. Uh, we'll do that seven times as well. Uh, and then Jambel uh, Bau. Doesn't dance hard again. Okay, so, yeah, and then that'll complete the ceremony. So the long life prayer for His Holiness three times in Tibet. And then we'll do uh, uh, Rinpoche's prayer only in Tibet seven times. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. 